Okay, uh, let's get started with the duality gap. So in the previous class, we studied a branch and bound algorithm. We studied uh, some necessary and sufficient conditions uh, about duality. So in particular, if geometric multiplier exists, then you have a necessary and sufficient condition uh, for optimality of a specific point. And in fact, the, the real thing that you would want to know when you're, when you're given a problem is, how do you know if a geometric multiplier exists in that problem or not? And so that's what we are going to discuss today. Uh, in particular, we want to, we want to say, the question is, when, under what condition there is no duality gap. You know my handwriting is becoming progressively unreadable. Uh, it is very much <laughs> the fatigue uh, by writing the same thing again and again. Maybe next year I should teach a different course. Then there will be no fatigue, right? Okay. Um, and you know, the, the even though we cannot really characterize all possible conditions under which there will be no duality gap, uh, there is still some fairly general conditions, especially for convex problems. So today we are going to talk about convex problems. So and we'll try to see why, uh, for at least for uh, some fairly, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll try to, so what I'll do is I'll introduce a few results in uh, linear uh, in linear algebra analysis kind of results. And then we'll see how that directly gives us no duality gap uh, result. Okay, and remember I want to again draw the picture for duality gap so that it gets etched in your memory and you never forget it until your retirement. Okay, you can forget it after retirement, that's completely fine because you're not doing any useful work anyways after retirement. Okay, so this is my GX space, this is my FX space. And then let's say this is what my set S is, GX, FX. X in capital X. This is my this is my F star. This is the hyperplane that keeps S on the positive side with normal mu comma one, and this is my Q star, and this is the duality gap. Okay, this gap between F star and Q star is the duality gap. And what we want to find out is, uh, what we will study today is that if the problem is convex, satisfies some conditions, there is no duality gap. So F star coincides with Q star here in this figure. So weak duality says Q star is less than equal to F star. Okay, so today we are going to talk about strong duality where Q star is equal to F star. So 
the first result is <coughs> f from rn to r convex gx equals to ax minus b this is known as polyhedral constraint and f, st f star is finite. Okay, so the problem is well posed. This implies q star equals to f star. So optimal dual solution or optimal dual value is the same as optimal primal value. One thing you will notice is we require the function f to be convex over the entire space Rn, okay? So we don't want it to be convex only when gx is less than or equal to zero. We want the function to be convex in the entire space Rn. Okay, so the note f should be convex in Rn, okay, because you know some of you might come and argue that you know how does it matter if f is convex over the entire set, or I mean entire space Rn, As, what you would say is you know let us assume that f is convex when Ax is less than or equal to b, so f is convex when Ax is less than or equal to b, so in this set, uh, it doesn't work out. Okay, it doesn't work out, and it'll be clear when we come up with the proof uh, why that is the case. Well, actually, it's not. It's not going to be clear, but at least you will see why uh, that's the case when I introduce Farkas lemma. So you want f to be convex over the entire R, and this is not not sufficient. And you know what, it has something to do with the fact that this set S will change the shape accordingly uh, if F was convex over the entire set Rn or if F was convex only in this restricted set Ax less than or equal to B. Okay, so this, this part of the figure will change depending upon what assumptions you make on F. Any question? Okay. So how do we prove this result? Well, the idea is to use Farkas lemma. So the setting is C is a convex set f from C to R is a convex function and S equals to x such that Ax less than equals to B is a polyhedral set. And f x is greater than or equal to zero for all x in C intersection S. So these are the four assumptions. This implies there exists mu in R R. I haven't said what R is, but R is the number of constraints G, right? So that's kind of clear. It's the number of rows of A or equivalently number of elements in B. So that's RR mu greater than or equal to zero such that Fx plus mu transpose Ax minus B 
is greater than equal to 0 for all x in C. Okay. So, that is the Farkas lemma and what is this set, what is this mu? So, let us see, uh, let me delete this part. I mean I am not going to prove this result, but I will give you a pictorial proof of what this lemma is saying. this is my x, this is my w, this is my set A, such that uh, x comma w such that f of x is less than w, x is in C. Okay, so we pick all the values of x and c, we figure out what the value of fx is going to look like and then we draw the set of entire w that is greater than or equal to that fx. Okay, that was a little bit of entertainment, it was intended. <laughs> okay. You know, in my, very soon you will be filling up SEIs, right? So you should say that the class was very entertaining, okay? Because of, okay. And so what you want to do is, all you have to do is prove the existence of one such point. So essentially you pick a point X here at which this crosses this axis and then you draw a hyperplane and this hyperplane will always have mu greater than or equal to 0 okay this is by the way known as supporting hyperplane theorem which i haven't formally introduced in the class there are two main hyperplane theorems one is supporting hyperplane theorem one is separating hyperplane theorem the supporting says that if you have a convex set, you can draw a hyperplane that supports the entire set on the positive side, okay? So, so what that means is, this is a convex set, so you can prove because of all these, all these assumptions that we have made, C is a convex set, F is a convex function, S is blah, 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 right? So, so what that means is this entire set A that you have drawn in this X comma W space, that's going to be a convex set, right? And what supporting hyperplane theorem says is that you pick any point, well, you don't have to pick a point, but, but you pick a point, but what in this particular example, in this particular case, what you're doing is picking a point at the boundary, and then what the supporting hyperplane theorem says is you can always draw a hyperplane so that the entire set is contained in the positive half space. Okay, so that's, uh, supporting hyperplane theorem. I, uh, this is something that you would, ha have any of you seen supporting hyperplane theorem in any other class? No? Okay. Then I, I don't think it's, uh, well, I think it's necessary, but maybe I don't want to teach it. Okay, so, uh, so that's the idea of supporting hyperplane theorem. You have a convex set, if you find a point at the boundary of the convex set, you can draw a hyperplane so that the entire convex set is con contained in the positive half space, okay? Equivalently, you can draw a line so that the entire po convex set co is contained in the negative half space. So that's supporting hyperplane theorem, but you want the set S to be convex. Whatever set you want to support, 
that has to be a convex set. Uh, and then there is separating hyperplane theorem which says that if you have two convex set, you can always draw a line that separates the two convex sets. Okay, that's separating hyperplane theorem. So those are the two important theorems that are widely used in optimization. And I mean, I have used mostly in optimization, but you can also probably use it in in infinite dimensional spaces, so differential equations and stuff. Um, we'll talk about it in the context of dynamic optimization, uh, probably next week onwards. Okay, that was a detour. But this is what this is what this theorem says that well, you can draw a line so that this equation f x plus mu transpose a x minus b is greater than or equal to zero for all x in C. Remember, f x was greater than or equal to zero for all x in C intersection S. Okay, so in C itself, f can take positive as well as negative values. But when you draw this curve, uh, sorry, when you draw this set A, and then you come up with a supporting hyperplane theorem, of course, you have to prove that mu is going to be always greater than or equal to zero. So that's something you have to prove. And then, once you prove that, what you have, the final result is fx plus mu transpose ax minus b. So this is gx, right? This is my gx here. So what you have is fx plus mu transpose gx is always greater than or equal to 0 for all x and c. So th there is no s here. Okay, There is no s here. This is only for all x and c. So that's good. So that is the uh, representation, so, so uh, the graphical representation of Farkas lemma. And so we can use that result for proving this theorem as follows. It becomes a fairly one line proof. So. So I'm going to define f of x equals to fx minus f star. C equals to rn, s equals to ax minus b uh, less than equal to 0. And that's it. That's all you need to uh, you need to do. C is a convex set. Yes. F is a convex function over the entire set. Yes. S is this set. Is f x greater than or equal to zero for all x and c intersection S? Well, that's true. Because remember, f star is the optimal value of the function in this set, right? Since it is the optimal value in this set S. If you take fx minus f star, it's always going to be non-negative. Right? So we have this condition satisfied. So there exists a mu such that this equation holds. What does that mean? This means from Farkas There exists a mu greater than or equal to zero such that fx minus f star plus mu transpose gx is less than is greater than or equal to zero. Okay. This means that f star is less than or equal to fx plus mu transpose gx. By the way, this is for all x in Rn. This is for all x in Rn. Okay, so I get this for all x in Rn. 
Now what should I do? I want to show that Q star is equal to F star. So what's the next step? What should I do? What is this part? This is the Lagrangian, right? So let me write it as L of X comma mu for all X in R and What should I do now? Any thoughts? Okay, so I have this constant. This is a constant, right? This is a finite constant. F star is finite. So I have a finite constant that is less than equal to the Lagrangian for a specific value of mu remember that mu comes from here okay so it's not some any possible any possible mu greater than or equal to 0 that's a specific mu that is that comes from some sort of separating hyperplane theorem right so so it's not all possible mu but for all for all x in rn so this holds for all x in rn but for a specific value of mu greater than or equal to 0 So what else? What's the trick? What's the next trick to use? Any suggestion? Even if it's a wildly wrong suggestion, you should make that suggestion. Sorry? Maximum overall mu? Okay, so let me try to qualify that suggestion. Let's take the infimum over x first. Okay, so what I get is f star is less than or equal to infimum over all x in R n L of x comma mu. What is this equal to? This expression? Q of mu, right? Q of mu, which is less than or equal to any thoughts? Supremum over all mu in R R mu greater than or equal to 0. You know what? Let me just put a mu bar. No, not mu bar, mu tilde. So that way you don't confuse between any arbitrary mu. Okay. All of them have tilde now? Yeah. Okay. Okay. And what is this equal to? This is equal to Q star. Okay. Is that is that clear to everyone? Okay, so that's the trick. So I first first take the infimum over all x, then I realize that this is Q mu tilde, which has to be less than or equal to the supremum over all possible mu of Q mu. Right, which is equal to Q star. Now I know that Q star weak duality holds for any problem. Okay, no matter what your optimization problem is, weak duality will always hold. Why? Because you have proved the min max result. Right, min max is equal to is greater than or equal to max min. So that's what this weak duality says. So min, weak duality works under all circumstances. No matter what your optimization problem is, weak duality will always hold. But for this specific case, when f is convex, g is polyhedral, f star is finite, for this specific case, what you proved is f star is less than or equal to q star. Okay? So this means f star is less than or equal to q star. Okay? This coupled with weak duality gives you the final result that q star is equal to f star. Okay. 
Any question so far? Okay, so this is the trick that you have to play. You are given a problem, I ask you where we, well, I won't ask you, maybe I'll ask you in final exam, okay? You are asked whether strong duality holds for a specific problem or not. How would you go about proving it? Well, all you have to show is F star is less than or equal to Q star, okay? Because, you know that Q star is always less than or equal to F star, so all you have to show, if you show this, that's it, you are done, strong duality holds. And the optimal solution of the dual problem, if it exists, will give you the geometric multiplier for the original problem. Okay. So that's good. Now let's talk about the strong duality result for a more general convex problem, okay? So let's, uh, let's talk about a more general convex problem where we cannot apply for cast lemma. So I want to minimize f of x, x and x, gx less than equal to 0 and everything is convex, f, g, x, convex. So, and we also assume that there is a, the problem is feasible. Feasible means there exists a point in the set x that satisfies this constraint gx less than or equal to 0, right? Otherwise, you are essentially looking at minimizing a function over an empty set, doesn't make sense, right? So that's what feasibility is. There exists a point in the set x such that gx is less than or equal to 0. So we make this assumption that the problem, so let me define Slater constraint qualification definition, Slater constraint qualification which says that there exists an x bar in x such that g j x bar is strictly less than 0 for all j. Okay, so there is a point, so here is, here is how you should think about it. Let's say X is my sphere or a circle, right? And these are my four, uh, so G1 of X less than equal to, G1 of X equal to zero, G2 of X equal to zero, G3 of X equal to zero, and G4 of X equal to zero. And I'm looking at this particular region, GX less than equal to zero. So there has to be a point x, x bar, which lies in the set x and for which gx, gj x bar is strictly less than 0, okay? So you have x bar here. What would be the other extreme? The other extreme is you have the set x and this is the only point that is feasible, right? So we want to remove such a condition. So this is g1 of x equal to 0, this is g2 of x equal to 0, okay? And then it meets only at one point. So there's only one point in the feasible region. So you want to remove such a, 
those cases okay you want to consider these cases where you have a point in the set x such that gx is strictly less than 0 and then the theorem is f g x convex it's a feasible problem and slater constraint qualification is met then q star is equal to f star okay we need this condition and then we need slater con constraint qualification to prove this result okay now the proof of this particular result also requires supporting hyperplane theorem and instead of writing the complete proof i'll again give you the geometric picture of why this result holds but it has very similar ideas as we saw in the previous uh, improving farkas lemma so so it will have uh, quite a bit of similarity in that sense okay so the first step is to consider the set a for this particular problem just like we did in the previous problem so i'm going to define set a as z comma w such that there exists an x in capital x with gx less than equal to z and fx less than equal to w okay so this is my f of x this is my g of x and remember we talked about the set s that looks something like this what is the set a what what would it look like so well a contains point so a contains all the points such that there exist a gx comma fx points below it right below it and left to it Uh, and left of that point so let's consider this point okay is it part of a or not well is there a gx so this is my this is my w and this is my z is there a point with gx less than equal to z no is there a point Does that fx is less than equal to w? Well, there are a lot of points where fx is less than equal to w, right? But it doesn't meet this criteria. Gx less than equal to z, so this point is not in the set A. Okay, fine. What about what about this point? So I need to find a point. says that gx is less than equal to z and fx is less than equal to w so let's say this point okay i can pick any point in this region okay i can pick any point in this region and there this is my w this is my z so if you look at gx gx is less than equal to z yes is fx less than equal to w so w is here so is fx less than equal to w yes right so this point is part of the set a if you look at this point is that part of this so, sorry not this point this point is part of the set a okay so this point is part of the set a similarly this point is part of the set a 
So everything here, everything in this region is part of the set A and let me draw it this way okay and everything here is also part of the set A. So A is everything contained in this particular region. Okay. You know what this part will not be this this region will not be part of A. Well no it should probably should be this way. So everything above it is part of A. So that's what this set A is. Now remember for supporting hyperplane theorem you need this set A to be convex, right? And this is this looks like a non-convex set. Right? So if we make these assumptions that f is convex, g is convex, x is convex, blah, 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 then you have to prove that this set A is convex. Okay? So, so this, the proof of this result, the proof of this theorem goes with several uh, sequence that you have to prove. So the fact one is A is convex. So even though in this figure A is not convex because it's not meant with f, g, x to be convex and feasible and all those constraints that we have endowed on this problem, if you put those constraints on this problem, then you will see that A is actually convex and then fact 2 that you can prove is 0 f star is in the boundary of A. Well, is on the boundary of A. So let me draw such an A. What would that look like? Okay, this is what the a is going to look like and then 0 comma f star would lie on the boundary of A. This is what it's going to look like. This part actually is easier to prove because if this was not on the boundary, if this was in the interior of A, if this was 0 comma f star, then you, you can essentially achieve f star minus epsilon by changing a different value, by picking a different value of x and therefore it is not the optimal point. So you can prove it by contradiction that if this claim does not hold true, if 0 f star is not on the boundary, then f star is not the optimal value. Okay? So you can prove that part by contradiction. And then fact 3 is use supporting hyperplane theorem uh, to get mu beta not equals to 0, 0 such that beta f star, so mu transpose 0 plus beta multiplied by f star is less than or equal to mu transpose z plus beta w for all z comma w in A. Okay, we are not there yet. We are far from the the uh, we are from far from proving the theorem, but at least we are somewhat close by. So, what is this fact three saying? Well, this point zero comma f star is at the boundary. So, 
So I can draw a line that passes through 0 comma f star and keeps this entire set A in the positive half space. So if you pick any point z comma w in A, its value will be greater than or equal to the value at this particular point because it's in the positive half space. So this is this this is this line mu transpose z plus beta f equals to beta w equals to 0. That's this line. And since A is positive half A is in the positive half space, if I pick any point of A, its value is going to be greater than or equal to, well, this should be beta f star. So the value should be greater than or equal to beta f star. Okay, any question so far? Yeah. So you want to, so this is my definition, there is nothing, I just define a set A, okay. How, how did I define it? Well, I have to be able to find an X, so I have to be able to find a point in the set S, okay, such that GX is less than or equal to Z and FX is less than or equal to W, okay. So this is my set S, okay, and if you think about it, I can pick any point here, okay, and let's say I pick a point here. I have to be able to find a point in the set S, which is below this point and towards the left side of this particular point, okay, so left and south of this point. So I pick a point here, this point in the set S is below the point and on the left side of this point. Okay, if I pick a point here, I can find a point here which is below the, I mean it, ha it can be at the same level too, okay, but it has to be either at the same level or below this point and towards the left side. So I can find this point in the set S which is below this point and towards the left side. Let's say I pick a point here at this point, I can find a point which is at the same level, right, but towards the left side. Now let's come here. I pick a point here. There is a point in the set S which is below it and it's at the same level. It's not at the left side but it's at the same level. So this less than or equal to says that it can be either at the same level or it has to be on this side. And same similar, well this is saying it has to be below or at the same level and what this is saying it has to be on the left side or at the same level. Okay, so I constructed this set S. So I have the set S, I constructed the set A. It turns out you can prove it that A is a convex set, okay? Not a very difficult thing to prove. Then you observe that zero comma F star has to be at the boundary of A, okay? So this is my zero comma F star that's at the boundary of A, okay? So it can't be in the interior, so you can't have a zero comma F star here. Okay, it has to be at the boundary. Then you say, you know what? I know that A is a convex set. I have a point on the boundary. I can draw a supporting hyperplane at that point. So what does supporting hyperplane say? Well, you have a mu comma beta, which is not equal to zero, zero. So it has to be a non-trivial line such that mu transpose z plus beta transpose w for all z w in A has to be greater than or equal to mu transpose 0 plus beta multiplied by f star. Okay, that's this line. That's this line. Okay, mu transpose z plus beta w equals beta f star. That's this line. But any point in the set A will be in the positive half space, which means you will have the greater than or equal to sign here. Right, so, so that's what we are, so that's the point at which we are uh, stuck. We don't know how to proceed from there. Okay, is that, is that clear? Yes. So is your set S still that non-convex matter at the left part? Well, so in this, in this side it can be non-convex. 
But in this side, no, it will be convex. It has to be yeah. So it's the after you update that. Right. Right. Okay. So after we update for f, g, and x being convex, it will look like a convex set on this side. Okay. Remember that this side doesn't matter. What matters is this side, the bottom of the figure, because that's where f star is going to lie. Okay. F star won't lie on this side of the set S. Right, it will lie in the bottom of the set S. So that's where we have to concentrate uh, in this case. Okay, yes. So S is S is GX, FX, X in capital X. Okay, that's my set S. Set X is in some other space. Okay, x, x doesn't lie in this space. Remember, x is a subset of Rn, right? And what is this? This space, this is RR, and this is R. So it's completely different space. And this A encompasses the set S inside it. A is much, much larger. A goes all the way to infinity. Okay, but S lies within the set A that we have defined in that specific fashion. Sorry, fact two. Uh, no, not really. No, the way to prove fact two is through contradiction. So if it is not in the boundary of the set A, then you can find a point f star minus epsilon in the set S itself. No, why would you say that? I don't know, I'm just asking. <laughs> I'm trying to think of a counter example. So, eight, so if A is not convex, again, factor, factor holds or not? That's my question. Do you have, who said not necessary? No, I, I was saying it's not necessary. Okay, do you have a example or counter example in mind? No? Okay, so his point is, suppose A is non-convex for whatever problem, okay, he came up, he cooked up a problem, not a convex problem, okay, because we know that for convex problem, this has to be true. So let's say we started with a non-convex problem. His question is whether zero F star can be on the boundary of A, even though A itself is non-convex. Okay. Well, I... So, let's say this is my set S, okay? So what would my set A look like? Well, my set A is going to look like this, this, uh, this, and then I have to go this way. No, and then I have to go this way. What is the bottom part? The last two? It should. See, if I pick a point here, uh -huh. I can find a point on the left side. Right. Right? At the same level. Right. So this should be part of A. Similarly, this point should be part of A because I can find a point towards the left side at the same level. Now, this part will go as it is, right? Because it's all part of the set S, and then I have to draw a line which is horizontal. Uh, and then this will be my A. So what is 0 comma F star? This is 0 comma F star, right? So in this example, it does seem like 0 comma F star seems to be part of A, okay? Do you see this? Yeah, so even though A was non-convex, we have zero F star on the boundary of A. So those two are independent facts. Okay. Let's move on to fact four. 
and pack 4 says that guess what mu has to be greater than equal to 0 beta also has to be greater than equal to 0 this argument needs to be made uh, how can you make this argument oh I see you just massage these equations a little bit to get this result fact 4 okay then fact 5 says well beta has to be strictly positive okay and this is proof by contradiction okay and some of you may know I don't like proof by contradiction but uh, I can't get around it sorry beta is the coefficient corresponding to f star okay so why why isn't mu uh, also greater than 0 sorry what why why isn't mu also greater strictly greater than 0 because i can have a line for instance i can have a line that is just horizontal so then from fact 3 that's just a condition so all i need is mu and beta both of them cannot simultaneously be equal to 0 okay if beta is I mean beta being 0 is fine as long as mu is non zero and mu being 0 is fine as long as beta is non zero what fact 5 is saying is beta is greater than 0 no matter what okay it's strictly greater than 0 and then 6 says let me write it here then fact 6 is f star is less than equal to fx plus mu tilde transpose gx which is equal to l x comma mu tilde now the way I define my mu tilde is mu over beta okay we are, we get at the same equation like in the previous case we construct a mu from supporting hyperplane theorem right and then we get this equation that f star is less than equal to the lagrangian specified at that specific vector mu that you get from supporting hyperplane theorem and then fact 7 well you play the same trick f star is less than equal to inf over x in x l of x comma mu tilde which is equals to q of mu tilde which is less than equal to supremum of q mu mu greater than equal to 0 which is equal to q star and that gives me the result right f star is equal to q star okay so the reason why I I mean I I won't go into the details of each of these facts okay because they are uh, you need to argue it carefully and this is something that you have to do either at home or you can read the book and understand the argument but I wanted to give you a flavor of what it means to prove a result of this sort okay uh, if you want to prove something in optimization usually it's not a straightforward proof you have to go through a sequence of steps construct a set appropriately prove that it is convex and then you have to go through a sequence of steps some of which involves results from real analysis like supporting hyperplane theorem or separating hyperplane theorem so you use those results to construct uh, Lagrange multiplier well not Lagrange multipliers but some vectors right and from those vectors you have to again prove certain results to get to this final form and this is the form after which everything is straightforward okay so until you get here requires some sort of non trivial thinking okay something that's not as straightforward something that won't just pop out of writing equations so understanding the geometry 
of the problem, the optimization problem in some other space is very useful for proving results of this type. Remember, that's what we wanted to do. This is completely, it doesn't use calculus whatsoever. Nowhere have I written the differentiation of the function is this, the second derivative looks something like this. You know, we have to use Newton's method and so on and so forth. None of that works here, okay? All you need is f being convex. I don't care if it is di non-differentiable. g being convex, I don't care if it is not differentiable. x being convex, I don't care whether it's a polyhedron set or not, right? All we need is one of these, I mean, this uh, specific constraint qualification, which is fine. We might have to make such assumptions, uh, but actually if you think about it we didn't really use it in the proof right but we actually used it in proving well i didn't write it but in proving that a is uh, a has an interior okay so the way to prove that a has an interior is using slater constraint qualification which is required for finding the supporting hyperplane theorem for applying the supporting hyperplane theorem okay so anyways so we did not use calculus whatsoever in trying to understand about duality, duality gaps, and uh, finding geometric multipliers. So that's really the power of these methods. Now, you can apply these methods. Now you can understand about geometric, now that you have understood, understood about geometric multipliers, you can use it to design algorithms for integer optimization problems, uh, for optimization problems that doesn't, uh, that, has objective functions that are not differentiable and so on, okay? Uh, we are not going to study algorithms of that type, that's not part of this course, okay? So in the subsequent class, I will, maybe I'll pick up a few algorithms that I like and I'll cover it. But now onwards, we will talk predominantly about dynamic optimization and then I'll cover neural network in brief, then we'll do stochastic optimization and news vendor problem. Then we'll talk about semi-definite programming where you cast the optimization problem over the space of matrices and you try to solve those problems. And then if time permits, we'll talk about Markov decision problems, which has gained substantial attention in the recent past because of robotics and autonomous car applications. Okay, so we'll do all this study and develop the theoretical foundation for doing complex optimization, for solving complex optimization problems. All right, thank you guys.